Can you guess today's topic by looking at the picture? It's in Luke chapter 8. You might be able to guess if you could tell what that is in the middle. Sarah said, what are those? I said, that's wheat. Those are seeds. It doesn't look like uh, normal kinds. In fact, it looks like some cereal to me. For, uh, honey smacks, I think. Which are wheat seeds, right? I think, anyway. We're going to be in Luke chapter 8 today, though, for um, a very familiar parable, the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is about how people respond to the gospel, different responses to the gospel. And of course, like all of Jesus' teaching, it's a cause for some reflection, some self-examination to see, you know, how does this speak to me? How does it speak to you? So begin in Luke chapter 8, verse 4. When a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path, was trampled underfoot, birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So as, you, as we know and as we can see, there's four types of soil. And before we examine those and dive into them, let's just consider a little bit about the context of the parable of what's going on here from what we can see. Verse 4 tells us the setting of it. The setting was that a great crowd was gathered. And people from town after town came to him. And then he said in this parable, so the parable is prompted by this huge response to Jesus. On the surface, you would think, well, this is awesome. And I'm sure that it was awesome. Uh, it's what you would hope for. That when the Son of God came, when the Messiah came, people just flocked to him. People flooded. And that's what happened at, at times. Not all the time, but at times, especially in the early part of his ministry. He was very popular with people. And of course, they, he was doing miracles. And uh, he was teaching. But you had people just crowds and, and you might recall the times he had they had to come up with some way to feed everybody and there were thousands of people thousands of people coming to hear what Jesus had to say and from our vantage point we would think this is all working perfectly everybody's there and Jesus is teaching them what a wonderful thing but Jesus lets us know that not all of these people who have come will be disciples unfortunately not all these people are going to be profited by what they would hear from his teaching. In fact, you could kind of divide the people up into two groups. Look down at verses 9 and 10. When his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. That's interesting because it shows us that parables are more complex than we would uh, often think. A lot of times we think of a parable as an uh, explanation, uh, an illustration, not, not unlike this picture on the screen. Something that kind of goes along with the point that maybe helps us uh, get the point. Um, you know, um, let, let me illustrate it this way. Let me tell you a story. And that story kind of helps us to see um, some deeper meaning. And that is the truth about parables. They are that. But Jesus shows us that also they, had, they, could, be, they could have the effect of obscuring the meaning. It would be like telling the illustration without explaining the rest of the, the message and then letting people try to you know, see if they could understand what it means. Just put the picture on the screen and not say, not kind of tell you more about it. That's a little bit surprising that um, the parables would be used that way. And yet Jesus explains this in a little more detail in a similar passage in Matthew, the parallel account. It says all these things... Um, maybe not the exact parallel to that occasion, but on another occasion, I think it is. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And so he was going to be revealing these hidden truths, but very often they were packaged in a parable that I think we could think of as sort of the husk on the seed. It, it would serve as a way to contain the seed until the seed finds its way to the appropriate um, 
setting and soil for it to germinate and, and take, you know, become something that's alive. So there's a kind of a container. And in some ways, the parables where this, the hidden message is there and it's available, but it is packaged in a way that you were going to have to dig a little deeper to understand it. Um, just prior to this, in verse 33, it says, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. And so sometimes he would say a parable like that, and then that's the verse right before this. And, it's, and there was more parables before that. And Matthew tells us that Jesus was talking to them. He's just telling them all these parables. And so, you know, imagine if that's all you heard and you didn't know, well, that's interesting. I kind of get that there's leaven and there's flour, but what's he telling me about the kingdom? What is the, what is the meaning inside of the parable? What is that deeper point that he's trying to make? I, I understand this picture, but I don't know what the, how to connect it. Well, very often... The disciples, and immediately after this, in the verse 36, so after that, they come to him when the crowds were gone, just like they did in our passage, and they say, tell us about this parable. Like, explain it to us. So tell us what it means. And then Jesus would uh, then kind of break it down and give them that deeper meaning. And that tells us that if someone wanted, you know, you could go hear Jesus speak, but if you really wanted to understand the meaning of it, you were going to have to, to dig for it. You were going to have to look for it, seek for it. Um, it wasn't just obvious. So you could imagine that this crowd, a thousand people might come, and then some of them would go home, and maybe somebody they talked to would say, hey, you got to see Jesus, didn't you? Didn't you go to see Jesus and, and hear him talking? And they would say yes. And Well, what did he say? What was his message? And you could imagine that some people would say, well, it was something about, he talked about uh, planting, and um, he talked about, um, you know, sowing seeds, and he, you know, he, he told some stories about things, and I don't really know what he was, what it was all about. Someone else could go home and have their life forever changed by what they heard. And the difference is between the two is really the difference in the kind of soil that the seed was falling on. And I really think that's what Jesus' parable of the sower is all about. What determines whether this seed is going to um, take root in someone's life and produce a plant or not really is determined by the person's heart. And so as we go back to our parable today in Luke chapter 8, we see that Jesus is going to explain it himself, which is uh, good because we don't have to try to figure out what it means. We can just let Jesus tell us as we sit with his disciples and say, okay, explain this to us. We want to understand. It. Tell us what this means about the seeds and the soils. And so Jesus does explain it. Verse 11, back in Luke chapter 8, verse 11. He said, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. We'll just pause there for a second. Seeds are fascinating things. And they are alive, which is also fascinating. It's amazing that a seed is alive. Uh, it doesn't look very much like it's alive. It doesn't look very impressive. Uh, when you just look at it, there's no way, you know, I don't even know how you would tell that it's alive. The only way to know is to plant it, right? Otherwise, how would you know that it's alive? It's not doing anything. But it contains in it everything that's needed, like an apple seed or a, a grape seed, a cherry seed, whatever it is. Isn't it amazing that in that little thing, or a wheat seed, or uh, I think that's rice, but in that little seed is everything that's needed to produce a plant that produces fruit and the flower. Think of all the details that are in a plant or a tree. Think about a cherry tree or, um, you know, any kind of tree with its blossoms and its trunk and its leaves and roots and how it works and how it produces fruit. And the instructions, everything you need to make that happen is in the little seed. And this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 where he talks about God created things and in them was a fruit and inside the fruit is the seed and that's just the way God made it. Well, his word is the same way. You have the word and it is alive and it is powerful. But it's like a seed. In the seed is everything that's needed to produce a disciple, a Christian. A fruit-bearing, righteous, saved, you know, person recreated in God's own image. Through the Spirit's power, in that seed is the life and it's everything that's needed to transform somebody. But it doesn't always work. And that's why we'll see, um, it's not the seed's fault, it's, it depends on where the seed falls. The other thing that is said that I want to point out about this is that 
the image here is of sowing. And that tells us something, too, about the gospel, I think. Um, there's different ways of planting things. Zach and I were discussing this. I was asking about modern farmers and if they still sow seed. He said, yeah, there's like three different ways you can do it. Um, you can just scatter it, and then, but you, some people will also scatter it and then come back over it with a disc or something to kind of stir up the ground and, and get it in better contact. And then there's drilling, which I didn't really completely understand. But there's actually, you can put the seed down in the ground, right? And uh, I know that some things, when you plant them, I remember this from being a kid in, in the garden, you know, they'd make like a little row and the seeds go and then you cover it all up. And there's different ways. But in this case, it's just taking the seed and scattering it. And I was wondering, well, how does that work if you don't plant it in the ground? But you can find little videos of it. It's amazing. People do these like um, time-lapse video of the seed germinating. And so the seed's just lying there on top of the soil. And after some time, it kind of opens up on the end. And at the same time, a little root-looking thing starts to go down and a little sprout starts to go up. And it happened together. But it's amazing that just lying on the dirt, um, just laying there, it can go down into the ground and go up and make a plant uh, without having any more attention if it finds the right place, right? That's the whole key to the whole thing. That if, if the soil is right, it will work and it will make a fruit-bearing plant. And so that brings us to this explanation of the, uh, the different types of soils. So Jesus goes on to explain in verse 12, the ones that fell along the path are those who heard who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. Remember that uh, in the parable it said that people walk on it, step on it, crush it underfoot, and then birds came. So the birds represent the um, Satan taking away this seed, which is an interesting thing. Of course, you would know if you were trying to plant stuff, if you just try to scatter some on the, on the sidewalk or where, where everybody walks, that ground is hard and hard packed. And it's sad to think that somebody's heart could be that way. Could someone's heart be like that? Well, Jesus tells us that it can. And I think we can see that if we think about it. Um, hopefully nobody here falls in this category. But, you know, imagine someone who grows up in the church. And they've heard, how many sermons would you think by the time they would have turned to an adult? How many Bible classes? How many hours? And, and assuming that they're having that as well at their, in their homes, maybe their mom and dad have read Bible stories to them and, and told them. Uh, that's in a way, like, of course, we're all planting this seed, right? But that person still has a choice in whether to accept that. They still, it, it depends on whether they want to, um, you know, take that into their heart or not. As to whether, you know, just because you've piled up seed there, doesn't guarantee that it's going to germinate and then, and then you know, take root. And you sometimes don't know when it's going to do that. Like, you, there's, you always hope that maybe that, that uh, in time, maybe that, they, that it will germinate. But there's no way to force it to happen. There's no way to kind of, you wish you could, right? As a, of course, as a parent, you would love to kind of dig down and force this thing and, like, pull the roots out and make it grow and, like, but you can't, no matter how bad you want to, you, no, nobody has the ability, to, even with the seed, you can't force it to do what it's supposed to do. All you can do is that the seed is there and, and you just hope that it will take root and germinate. And that's kind of a, a frightening thing, of course, about, about it, that it is possible that people would, um, you know, not accept it. And in uh, Matthew, Jesus explains this uh, as well. He said, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. With their eyes they can barely hear, with their ears and their eyes. I'm sorry, let me back up real quickly. This people's heart has grown dull. With their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So, it, you know, sadly, it would be possible to, um, you know, and any, even here, have you, you know these people that say, well, I've read the Bible cover to cover, but they don't believe any of it, and it has no effect on it. Um, even just hearing or even reading doesn't mean that it's going to germinate and, 
have this life-changing effect. You have to believe it. You have to accept it. You have to act on it. Um, otherwise, it's just uh, seed. And I think it's interesting that the uh, birds fly away with it and the devil snatches it away. And I think that we can see this as well in that, you know, it's amazing how if you don't act on something, if you don't believe it, how quickly it's forgotten. And, um, you know, even after hearing thousands of hours of lessons and sermons and Bible class and all that stuff, somebody could have very, very, very little basic knowledge about the Bible. You think like, where did all that go? How is it possible that you're not just like, you know, <laughs> filled with scripture? But um, it's amazing how it just vanishes. It just disappears like a bird taking flying off with it. If, if it doesn't find, if it doesn't germinate, if it doesn't find root and take soil, very likely it's going to, you know, just be carried away and be, and be lost. And that's a, that's a frightening thing as well. But this, Jesus is telling us this about hearts and they, how they respond. The next one is the rocky soil. And here he just says the rock, I think, in one of the, others, one of the other accounts is rocky soil. Verse 13, the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing fall away. It's amazing where all seeds will germinate. Um, <laughs> I wish they wouldn't germinate. Some, you know, like in a little crack in the sidewalk. Like, really? Um, you know, you got the whole yard, but that it fell right there, I guess. So it's going to grow up in that. How much dirt is there, anyway, in this crack in the sidewalk? You know, it must be just a, unless it's getting down into something else, I don't know. But it's amazing how they'll pop up, you know, some tree tries to grow in the gutter. It's like, you know, that's not going to work very well. Um, so plants will try to germinate in places that are not hospitable, and they might do all right for a little bit. But if they don't have the depth of soil that he's talking about here, then when the sun comes up, when, when trouble comes, they wither. And this is sad to see as well. Sometimes people respond to the gospel in a moment when, it, when everything is just right. Um, it could be, you know, at a Bible camp. You spent the whole summer there and you're sort of, uh, you know, your, your mind and your heart's in the right place and you, you've been moved by things and other people you're around and it all resonates with you. Uh, it could be after staying up really late one night talking with a friend and, um, you know, just in, in a moment on that particular night, everything is clear and you're convicted, and you know what's right, and you know what you're supposed to do, and you, you know you decide you're going to do it. It could be in a jail cell. Um, you know, the sheriff of Lincoln County says, he, he asks this question sometimes. He said, do you believe Jesus is in jail? He said, I believe Jesus is in the jail. He said, the trouble we have is getting him out, because when people leave here, they leave him behind. And, um, you know, a lot of times people will find Jesus in jail, but... As soon as they walk through the door, they say, we cry, we've studied with them. We tell them this over and over and over. And I believe they're sincere. I have to believe it. I mean, they, they, they really, they seem very sincere. That they, they know this is true, and they know this is right, and they're thankful for it. And they're, but you know they're going to face a huge challenge when they walk out the doors, and they're faced with tribulation and struggles and temptation and the rest of the world. And, um, you know, so there's so many cases where, uh, the seed germinates in, a, in the right moment. Um, you know, sometimes there's just those moments in life. Could be after a funeral, could be after something, when, when everything is suddenly clear and somebody is like totally aware of what's real and what matters in, in eternity and their salvation and that the, their need for the gospel. And they respond to it and it's exciting and you don't know how it's going to turn out. But sometimes, sadly, as, it, as in this case, in time, it just you know, withers life gets back to the way it was, trouble comes along, difficulty comes, and their faith falters. Um, that shows us the need for being rooted and grounded and the urgency in that. Paul would write to the Colossians, therefore as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him, rooted, built up in Him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So when that, when that plant is so tender and young, it needs to be established. And you, you know that an established plant will, will do okay if there's a period without rain, if there's a super hot month or something. You know, even if it kind of dries a little bit, it'll be all right. It'll come out, it'll, it'll survive if it's established. But if, when you've just planted something, that's when it's dangerous. 
because it could be that it won't make it through the, um, you know, the time of difficulty. So that's the sad case of the seed on the rocky ground. And then we have the thorny ground. Verse 14, as for what was sown among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life and their fruit does not mature. The soil only has so much room for roots. It only has so much nutrients. It only receives so much rain. And there's only so much sunlight. So it can only sustain so much plant life, any given thing. So you, you picture like a little pot, and you're going to plant a plant in it. Well, you know, it can only, the plant can only get so big. You can only have so many things in this amount of dirt in this condition. And in this, this is a sad case of the gospel soil. The gospel seed finds this soil. It germinates. It takes root, produces a plant, which is good. But growing up with it are lots of other things. And compare the difference between why is it compared to a bramble or a thorn, um, weeds. Well, those are sort of useless plants. Um, it's not something that, that is, that we want. It's not desirable. It doesn't, you know, produce the fruit we're looking for. But they're growing up as well, right alongside the, the poor little gospel plant trying to grow. And so it's there, but it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't produce fruit. And you've probably had these things. I'm sure we're not the only ones where you, you have like a little planter and you, you're trying to get something going, but then some other stuff grows too. Or maybe in the landscaping. And before you know it, it's just kind of like half, you know, you can't even tell like what, what here is supposed to be here and what was, you know, what's grown up on its own. And I've had to, back in the day of uh, when you mow people's yards and uh, weed eat, sometimes it's hard to tell, like, is this thing supposed to be there? Did they plant this thing or did it just kind of grow up here? And am I supposed to cut this down and mow over it? Or, um, am I supposed to like mow around it? You know, it's, sometimes it's not easy to tell, like what's, what's supposed to be here and what's just growing on its own. And that's the scary thing. You know, if I had to guess about all these, if, if you've uh, been a Christian for any amount of time, you've probably already passed the, you don't have to worry about being the stony ground, I mean, the, the hard packed soil because the gospel has germinated in your life. Um, you know, so obviously you heard it and you responded to it, so you're not the sidewalk if you've, if you've gone that far. And if you've been a Christian long enough to have gone through some difficulties, um, you know, hopefully the gospel has rooted and established in your life. So I think that, you know, probably for a lot of us, we've passed those two stages. Not to say that that's the danger ever goes away, but I think that this one might be the greatest risk, that there's just other things. There's too much other stuff. And not all these things are sinful. Um, cares are not sinful. Cares, riches in and of themselves are not sinful. Pleasures in and of themselves are not sinful. I mean, there's a lot of things about life that's enjoyable, but it's just that life is competing with the gospel for your energy and your time and your heart and your attention. Life is trying to choke out the gospel and the, what it would have you become and the fruit that it wants to bear. And if we don't constantly pull those weeds, the, the, it could choke the gospel. And I think that's a great danger um, for even established Christians. And we know this can happen. A uh, sad case is the case of Demas. Do um, you remember Demas? He was a fellow worker with Paul. Paul calls him that in his letter to Philemon. Um, these people send greetings, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers, also in Colossians. He says, Luke, the beloved physician, sent, greet you, as does Demas. So here we got Demas. He's doing great. I mean, how cool would it be to have your name listed there among Paul's fellow workers in one of his letters? Like, hey, you know, that'd be really a good feeling. But later on, in one of Paul's last, maybe last letter, in 2 Timothy, this is the time he said, you know, I fought the good fight, I finished the course during that letter. He writes at the end of that, do your best to come to me soon, he's talking to Timothy. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. What happened to Demas? What happened? What happened between here and here? Well, it looks like the world, right? The world grew up and choked out the gospel so that when it came down to it, his heart was filled with, um, you know, a love of the world instead of a love of the, work, the Lord's work. And so I think that's, a, that's definitely a danger that we want to be on guard about. If, um, 
if everybody that walked in this morning, if we all walked in, if we could carry our heart in like a little planter, a little flower pot, and we could all sit here with it in our laps and look at it, you know, what would it look like? Um, hopefully there's nobody's that would just be hard and, you know, nothing growing. That's the case of the sidewalk that the soil, the seed never did germinate. It never, you know, did anything. Um, you know, maybe it's a tender little plant, but in a pretty rocky soil that's barely clinging to life. Um, you know, that's only going to last till some time of trouble comes. That's possible. But, but how many would be just kind of overgrown with all kinds of stuff? And this one is that, and this is something, and this is that. It's all these things that are consuming my energy and time, but, but distracting me from um, actually growing and being fruitful in the Lord's kingdom. Um, you know, hopefully not. That would be a scary thing if that was the case. But, you know, whether we can't really see ourselves quite that clearly like we would if we had our little pot. But you know who does see us just exactly like that? is the Lord, because he knows, he sees our hearts, and he knows what's going on. And uh, so it's lessons like this that give us a chance to try to examine ourselves and see us as he sees us and, and take stock of where we are. Now, what we want to be, of course, is this good soil. So the good soil is described in verse 15. He said, as for that good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So there's several things here that are said. Let's look at them closely. First, it says they hear the word. Jesus often said, we've already seen it here, those who have ears to hear, let him hear. That means not just the, you hear the sound. Isn't it amazing how you can tune out things? Um, I remember being really good at that. I'm probably still good at it. But I remember as a kid being able to just tune out. So a sermon starts to sound like those adults on Charlie Brown, you know, wah, 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 wah. And you just watch the clock going, and it's like, how long is it going to be? Wah, 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 wah. Let's stand and sing. I got that part right. Okay. And uh, but if you were to say what was what was said, I don't know. You know, I was, uh, you know, another place. Um, you know, we have the ability to tune things out, but we also have the ability to tune in. And Jesus would say, "He who has ears to hear, let him hear." And he knew good and well that there were people within earshot of him who were not paying attention to what he was saying. They were not getting it. They were not hearing. It. But the good soul hears. And um, then it says, who hearing the word, hold it fast. So that's the, that's the it's, it gets root, and they, they, they hang on to it. They hold it fast. They hold on to it in a good and honest heart and bear fruit with patience. I thought that word honest kind of jumped out at me this time. What does it mean? Why is honesty, what does honesty have to do in this context? It's, it's key because... First of all, we're going to have to be honest with the word. You know, it'd be easy to be um, like try to make it say what we want it to say and not let it speak honestly to us, to tune out parts we don't like, to force it to fit something that we've always thought. To, you know, but it's going to take honesty. Honesty. What is, it, what, is, what is this honestly saying to you? The word. And then an honest assessment of self. That's hard. But being honest with yourself, because it's so easy to kind of um, plaster over our flaws and in our mind excuse ourselves and in our mind give ourselves all kinds of reasons why it's okay that we are the way we are. And Well, it's not really my fault and, um, you know, I, I can't help this and that's just who I am. And we, so we, we cook up all these things to make ourselves feel better about any kind of inadequacies that we know. But if we're going to be truthful, and if the gospel is going to have its effect, we're going to have to be honest with ourselves about what the word is saying so that we can so that it can work. Otherwise it's not going to be effective. It reminded me of this description of the wisdom from above in James. Who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be a disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I think you could, in my opinion, you could take the word honest and like this, 
you could just uh, expand it. And this all encompasses what an honest heart is like. It's pure. It's peaceable. It's open to reason. It's, it's, it, it's willing to consider. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It is impartial. It is sincere. It, it, but if there's other things in there like, unfortunately, jealousy, ambition, selfishness, then it's going to cause us to lie and be false to the truth. So for the, for the heart to respond the proper way to the gospel, it needs to be a good and honest heart. And I think that's a good description of that. And then finally, of course, it said, and bears fruit with patience. Fruit doesn't happen overnight. Um, we all know that. I was uh, talking to Jacob, actually, after he left, and he, they've started an orchard. They're growing peaches. But he was telling me about all the work that went into it. They have 170 peach trees. And, uh, from the time you plant them, they're just little sticks. And, you know, he kind of talked me through the whole process. It's really fascinating. But it's a while before you go getting those peaches you can enjoy and eat. You know, it doesn't happen quickly. You've got to be patient. You've got to work. It takes a lot of effort. And um, the same thing's true with the gospel. We, it bears, we have to bear fruit with patience. We have to stick with it. We have to hold it fast. We have to let it have its effect in our lives. And then, in the, and then we will be fruitful Christians for the Lord. And so, let us consider this as uh, we wrap this up. If we look at ourselves, which kind of soil am I? The sad news is, if, if you happen to be the sidewalk kind, then this lesson won't do any good, and it won't really matter because you're not really listening. You know, I hope that's not true for anybody that's here, but that's the case, and Jesus knew that. And it doesn't mean there's some flaw with the seed. It just means you're not receptive to it. And, um, of course, we all pray for you that you would be receptive to it, if that's the case for anybody that's here. Um, you know, the Lord wants you to be receptive to it, but nobody can force that. It, and the Lord's not going to force it. You have to choose it for yourself. Um, maybe you're the rocky soil. Or maybe, you're, maybe you recognize as you look at yourself that there's quite a bit of things that have choked out the word in your life. Uh, maybe you recognize there's some work that needs to be done, some pruning, some, some weeding in your life. Um, let the word have its effect. If it's speaking to you, then don't reject it. Let it work in you and let it change you for the better. That's what the Lord desires for you. If you're here this morning and you've never been baptized, if you, if you know now what you need to do and, and you're ready to act on it and you don't want to put it off anymore, then, then today is the day to start. That would be awesome. And we would rejoice and angels in heaven would rejoice. It would be a wonderful thing. Uh, we have everything ready if you know what you need to do. If not, and you'd like to study more about it, we'd certainly be glad to do that. If you need to repent of sins or pray, ask for the prayers of the church, if there's any way that we can help, let us know as we stand and sing.